too. So this is going to, I'm going to try to go pretty fast because I have pictures to show. So I want to hit some, some points to keep in mind and then get to those pictures. This will echo many of the themes that we've heard throughout the day, but with more of a focus on trees. And I want to um, say a special thanks to this group of collaborators. It's on this slide here. Um, I've done just a fraction of surveying, and um, they've done the bulk of it, and, and identification work as well. So thank you to all of them. <clears throat> I want to get a little background on the Phytophthora species in the wildlands affecting trees that we're familiar with already. The first one being Phytophthora lateralis. This is the one that we were familiar with mostly here in California up until um, the past couple of decades. And you can see photos of the damage and the symptoms. And then, of course, the one that uh, most people are familiar with here that we're here to address by Topher or more. So that was the, that's, that, that's our background knowledge of how Topher is in the wildlands on trees primarily up until fairly recently. I want to do a little second section here just to remind everybody of why the picture can be complicated when you're trying to figure out what kinds of damage Phytophthora is causing out there to trees. Soil veining, very useful technique, and you've heard a lot about it today, and you've seen a lot of pictures of pears, and hopefully you ate something to get lunch too. Um, it's really useful, it's, it's sensitive to seasonality, as we've seen, and it's sensitive to the soil type as well. That picture on the left is a picture of some different soil horizons from Mendocino County. The one in the middle, you probably can't see it with enough resolution, but if you looked at those four soil samples closely, you could probably tell which one was likely to yield the Phytophthora species. It's the one that looks all sticky and wet and gooey. Um, it, it's hard to interpret results sometimes um, when you get positives from soil baby, because it's hard to sample volumes of soil sufficient to really give us a good picture of what's going on at scale. And it's also hard to interpret negative results because of the scale issue and because of the seasonality issue. Furthermore, if you get a positive from the soil, you know that it's in the soil. You don't know what it's doing on trees for sure. You can see an association between damage or mortality in the trees and the soil positive that you get but that's not sufficient to prove that that Phytophthora is causing that damage on the tree. So all of these things have to be kept in mind, weighed, taken with a little bit of a grain of salt when you're looking at soil baiting. With that said, it is an efficient way to survey for Phytophthora through this large landscape in California. Isolation from plant tissues is more of a gold standard. It tells you more, so you know that it's in the plant. Unfortunately, it can be very difficult to do, depending on which Phytophthora and which host you're trying to sample from. Stem cankers with remorum on oaks and tan oaks will often yield Phytophthora remorum, but many other species, it, no can do. It's much harder to get that Phytophthora to grow out of that stem tissue. The best tissues to isolate from can often be smaller medium roots. Obviously, those are hard to obtain and hard to find the symptomatic ones because there are so many of them. And even if you are able to sample the Phytophthora from plant tissue, you still need to go through Koch's postulates with that plant to, or hope that it's already been done with that plant species in order to really have a, a good grasp that this Phytophthora is causing this damage. The root samples on the top um, are two different samples of small redwood roots. Um, the one on the right, you can see, is a little bit different from the one on the left. When I baited from the one on the right, I did get um, an O of my seed. The one on the left, I did not. Um, and then there are just two more examples of damage caused to plant tissues by Phytophthora. And finally, the hosts themselves show a lot of variability in the way they decline and the way they die. There are season-to-season -season differences, year-to-year -year climatic differences um, that can influence what the pathogen is doing. 
um, hosts vary in resistance. Um, the pathogen, the same pathogen, can have different effects depending on topography and soil type. And oomycete pathogens seem to be able to go through these cycles of aggressiveness and then receding into the background on the landscape for a certain number of years, and then they'll come back again. And I'll talk about that again in just a second with Phytophthora cinnamomi. So I just wanted to show you now um, pictures. The work is done here, just bask in the <laughs> ugly destruction that um, we see. Actually, not all of it is so bad. A lot of this is decline rather than out and out mortality. But the first example is cinnamomi, and many of these pictures come from Ted and Liz, who have uh, been out there observing this and sampling these things for a long, long time. Um, I don't know which is the worst um, Ion Man's new picture, the one that Ted showed, or this one. They're both his pictures. Um, here's one from Alameda County on a variety of Arctostaphylus species as well as chinkapin. And um, feel free to, to interrupt and shout with pertinent details if there are any that it is. Um, here it is in Mendocino County on Jackson State Forest, um, affecting very visibly tan oaks as well as chinkapins, rhododendrons, lots of things. I mean, here it is in Bishop Pine. There's a really visible decline in Bishop Pine from Mendocino County down through Sonoma County. There's a different kind of decline in Bishop Pine on the Channel Islands. I don't know if those two declines are linked, but it's really dramatic in parts of Mendocino and Sonoma counties. And at this site, not in every site that we sample, but in this site for sure, there's Phytophthora cinnamomi in the soil, and then our malaria is attacking the root systems. You can see right there that there are no roots left on that bishop pine that fell down, and there's a lot of wind throw. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting, there, there are a few different things that are interesting about this particular site in Salt Point State Park. One is the high water table, and when you look into the history of this site, it echoes things that you read in the literature about Phytophthora cinnamomi from the eastern U.S. from the 30s and 40s. These are old field sites that were plowed at some point. That plowing probably helped encourage the formation of a clay hard pin under the soil. So it restricts root development, but it also is a good substrate for the pathogen to kind of slide around on. And it encourages this perched water table so that the trees are standing in water for a good part of the year. And that's exactly what it was like for shortleaf pine and lolly pine in the southeastern U.S. so many decades ago. It's, it's fascinating to see those echoes. Um, the other thing is that this has been a decline that's been going on for a long time. This person um, is Teresa Scholler. She's a retired professor from College of the Redwoods, and she's a really sharp observer of what's going on in the forest. Um, and has been for decades. And when we started to talk about Phytophthora cinnamomi, which was in the soil both here and up in Mendocino County, um, we, were, we were referring to chinkapin mortality up in Mendocino County. And she said, oh yeah, I remember now that in the 70s, there was an episode of this widespread chinkapin dieback that was um, notable enough that people were asking me about it. And I went out and I I didn't notice it. Nobody ever figured out what caused it, but then it just went away. So, kind of one of those interesting anecdotes that shows this cyclical nature of, of some of these pathogens. Um, and um, so, yeah. Oh, the other thing about cinnamomi is that the, the tree rings, if you look at the growth of these pine trees, there does seem to be a signal in, those, in, in that growth, and it's related to um, the variability in your, your precipitation. So not the absolute amount of precipitation, but how much variation there is over the decades is linked to growth in, in these tree rings. And the, the longer you extend that period out, the tighter the correlation is. So five years of variability in precipitation from year to year strongly influence the growth of, of a tree ring. 10 years even more so, and 20 years before that uh, is, is a very tight correlation. I mean, fairly tight, it's like, you know, 80% um, or 85%, something like that, maybe. Um, which really bears out what Eva said this morning about Phytophthora is often causing this long-term chronic decline that really, can be really hard to interpret what's going on with trees. Um, here's more cinnamomi. Um, We'll see this site tomorrow on the field trip. That's why I wanted to throw that one in. 
Um, keep in mind, again, many of these things are associations between soil bathing and tree mortality. Um, the cinnamomy in the pines is one where I did isolate it from roots, actually. Phytophthora cactoro on Tan Oaks in Mendocino County causing uh, bleeding cankers that look a lot like Phytophthora remorum, also causing some massive stress to um, mature redwood trees in certain sites. Um, this, this is an area where water is swept from this parking garage type area down through this muddy parking lot right to the bottom of these redwood trees. And they were sufficiently stressed that redwood, I, I assume they were um, redwood bark beetles, were trying to attack some of these trees. And uh, the trees still have some vitality, and they were actually denying entry to these beetles. And there are there is some green foliage still poking out here. Redwoods are extremely resilient. And this level of stress is something that you don't usually see with them. Um, this is Mount Madonna. This is adjacent to Mount Madonna County Park that Jeremy was telling us about, by Tatra Um More redwoods, this one down in Santa Cruz County. If you look at the, these redwood crowns compared with these, you can see a difference. This side is right next to, it's between a stream, a, an intermittent stream channel and an old orchard. And so that's exactly the kind of place you would expect to see Phytophthora issues. Um, Pseudocryptogea, these are Monterey pines on the Mendocino County coast. This is happened, these were completely, these are planted, um, and it's a beautiful stand actually at Monterey pines, but this has been within the past two years, maybe three years, this has been a very fast decline that I've been seeing at this site. Um, and you saw this picture already, Krista showed it to us of the manzanita here, the Presidio, the same pathogen. And here it is, this is, these are pictures from Kim, who has been sampling coast live oaks in Santa Barbara County, that the same pathogen was isolated from. And I think these were isolated from the stem canker, right? Okay, so that's, that's another uh, case where it actually came out of the plant itself. Um, last few slides, I talked about Cambibra. This is a, a Monterey pine seedling. Uh, this is another picture from Ted and Liz on Coast Live Oaks down in San Mateo County. Cambibra, we find very widespread in soil up in Humboldt County. Um, and then, of course, the situations where more than one is ganging up, and I'm sure that I usually miss these situations, but there are, are often other Phytophthora species that I'm not catching. And finally, um, I wanted to talk about this one, which is not a Phytophthora, but it has been treated as a Phytophthora by some people in the past and also as a Pythium. And this one I bring up just in case any of you have any special insight on it that you can give to me because I isolate this one from soils or bake this one from soils throughout the North Coast pretty commonly. Um, and usually what is drawing me to the sites is, is a decline in the vegetation. It can be a very general decline of lots of different kinds of species many of which are conifers. Um, in Humboldt County, it was interesting because there, were, there was a group of five dead, big, big redwood trees. They had been attacked by redwood bark beetles, and uh, they had been standing in water for a long time, for a month or two. Um, and so a couple of things had been apparently ganged up on them. I actually isolated, I did not, I baited roots, those, those fine roots that you saw, and that's what the um, Pythium undulatum came from. Also, cylindrocarpon species was causing this uh, symptom, which uh, is a classic blackfoot symptom um, caused by this species, but the cylindrocarpon also came out of those baited roots as well. So, kind of an odd situation, and the redwoods were definitely stressed, but they were very killed. So I'm curious about Pythium undulatum, because you both see in the literature that it's all over the place, cosmopolitan, but you also see two or three papers where pathogenicity tests have been done on both conifers and oaks, and it's caused a, quite a lot of damage, more so than cinnamomy in those pathogenicity tests. So I think this is a good, um, this is right for further study. My time's up. I was going to show um, more pictures from Ted about the spread of these things, but I think you already have gotten this picture over the course of the day and how these things work. Um, 
And I'll leave you with this um, downhill from a Caltrans pile in Humboldt County. These are all the things that came from the soil there. And um, there's a grad student here, Monix Landry, who is going to look more closely at some of these materials on the sides of roads and see what he can find in them. Uh, and with that, lots of people to thank. This is a map of, of the work that's reflected in this presentation, and I appreciate your attention.